Hi everybody, this is uh, Dr. Alice Lee. Welcome to iCube. This is episode number 15, believe it or not. This is my second year and I'm very uh, proud of the fact that we've, we're still around. <laughs> I am welcoming back uh, a wonderful colleague of mine, Dr. Fulton. Will you introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, hey, I'm uh, Bill Fulton and I'm an uh, Arizona native and uh, this will be my second episode. Yeah, yeah. And Welcome as back. you remember, I'm just an old country doctor. <laughs> so we're gonna plunge into this case. I'm gonna tell you the clinical scenario. It's a 62 year old guy. He is um, called in as a trauma B because he has fallen. It was reported as a ground level fall. The medics say that he was intoxicated, he was drunk and so he fell face down. They call it a trauma B because he's on Plavix and he's got facial, facial trauma. So Okay, so sounds familiar. good. Yeah. So that actually sounds like a young patient for us yeah. at our <laughs> ER. I'm 62, that guy's, <laughs> right. he's a teenager. That's right. So. Uh, it's a familiar scenario here in our emergency department because we have trauma bees like that. Um, so the patient arrives in your emergency department, you walk into the room and you meet him. He looks, um, he appears to be a well-developed, well-nourished guy. He does seem intoxicated. He's slurring his speech, but he's answering your questions and you're talking to him. The medics kind of move him over to the bed. So his blood pressure when he gets here is uh, blood pressure of 104 over 61. His pulse is 79. His respirations are 17. Saturation is 96% of room air. He's breathing, you know, easily, comfortably, and his temp is 36.6 orally. Okay. What so, do you think? So first off, just for your listeners, a trauma B at our institution, that's anybody who's on any blood thinners and has done a head plant. That's right. So that automatically, and so, um, at our level three trauma center, mm -hmm. then we will get a trauma surgeon involved with that. So Correct. that's good for them to know. Correct. So the first thing with head injury, obviously, is yeah. mental status. That's right. Right, because we all know that Glasgow Coma Scale, less than eight, we gotta intubate. So sounds like this guy's doing pretty well, yep. and his vital signs are good. So that, that allows us to kind of slow down and just do our secondary survey, see what's going on. Excellent. So then, um, you know, he's a Glasgow Coma Scale of 15, basically. I walk up to the bed to see the guy and chat with him a little bit to start my examination. What's obvious is that he's got a gauze pad taped to his forehead. You take that off. There's a 10 centimeter full thickness lack, oozing a little bit right in the middle of the forehead. There's a little bit of blood at the right nostril. It's kind of a dried blood. But you look at him and, and go, oh, well, uh, you know, he face planted. And as you're checking him out, he says, yeah, I don't remember what happened. I just remember drinking. And then the next thing I know, my wife's looking down at me and the medics are looking down at me. And then you continue talking with them, just everybody's playing their roles, they're getting the IV going, and then they're filling out the forms, and he goes, but doc, I can't move my arms. That makes you nervous, <laughs> and so, so obviously you're hoping we have a cervical collar on this guy, right? He does not have a board. He does not, okay. He, he did not come in on a board, nor did he have a collar on. Okay. So uh, that makes us, now we're nervous again, right? Because first <laughs> off, we're, we're kind of relaxing, uh, but now we're nervous. He can't move his arms, and we believe him, right? Yes, so I say to him, what do you mean you can't move your arms? And he repeats it, he's, Doc, I just, I can't move my arms. I said, does your neck hurt? Yeah, so I examined the back of his neck. He's really tender. The muscles are tight. Okay. okay? So, what now? So now you say, <laughs> can we please gently and let me let me control the head and the neck and let's get a collar on this guy, right? Right. Right. So I'm glad you said that because that's immediately what I, I, I did. I didn't I didn't really even continue the rest of my exam. I just got the staff, we just I held him in in line position and then we got him on a call put him in a collar and he was having pain when we were doing this. He was like kind of wincing a little bit. And we get him on the board, but log him onto the board, and we kind of gently tape him down to secure him. So then, after that, the rest of the exam was fortunately it was really actually pretty normal. His lower extremities, he had no um, bowel or bladder issues. He had normal strength. He had no paresthesias. Speaking of, as I'm kind of exam finishing up my exam, he he is really really sensitive to light touch shoulders down to his hands. You touch the guy, bar barely touch the 
skin and he's like ow, ow 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 that really hurts okay and he looks normal right he doesn't right. have trauma he's not sw swollen his arms are and in particular he seemed like he was really sensitive um more proximally than out to his hands okay so <coughs> doing a little bit more detailed exam i, I asked him to grip my hands and he has grip he has a weak grip of both both hands okay, okay? and i wanted him to show me his motor strength and what he does is he lifts his arms up flexes at the elbows and then they flop on his chest okay that's how what his motor strength it was very symmetrical he had a weak grip but he was able to move his arms but it was definitely not your normal motor strength okay right so then we proceed with the ed evaluation what would you have done i mean what evaluation would you have ordered yeah so so just to kind of back up a little bit what so we have excellent ems in mesa arizona my thought is, did, you know, it sounds like they didn't evaluate him, but even even going back further than that, I think it's easy as ER providers uh, and EMS providers, when we hear alcohol, we kind of automatically downgrade that patient. And I think it's important for us to remember that people that are intoxicated, people that maybe mentally, we think maybe they have a mental disorder, those people can have bad things happen to them. Absolutely, I think that is a very precautionary advice that we should all take to heart. Um, with this gentleman, who is clearly intoxicated, but he was still appropriate, right. that he, he was able to answer questions appropriately. He wasn't delirious, and he wasn't altered in the sense of his sensorium being confused. Right. Okay. So his history was actually very reliable. I ordered a CT head, neck, maxillofacial obviously right. and then the other types of uh, kind of trauma B x-rays so those scans come back and they're negative okay what do you think next well we know there we know something's abnormal on yep. this guy mm -hmm. and as as we all know sometimes there's a patient that you look at mm -hmm. and i think you and i were talking about this yeah. the other day right you you know something's wrong you get tests done and you don't find anything, but you know something's abnormal right. on this guy. So that's called a clinical gestalt, yeah, right? Yeah, clinical, clinical gestalt, that's good. Yeah. Now yeah. You look at the patient, you can't put your finger on it, but you know there's something wrong, we just have to dig deeper, right? Right. So with this gentleman, I was really alarmed. At the same time, I was also very uh, Probably curious. surprised everything was normal. Yeah, surprise. I was very curious, and I knew something had to be uh, had had. I knew that there was something wrong with his, probably wrong with his spinal cord. So I went ahead and ordered the MRI. Now, um, I try to limit the MRIs we do in the emergency setting because it's very time consuming and it's very costly. But in this, in this gentleman obviously has neurologic complaints, right? right. And he had legitimate physical findings that were very worrisome to me. So we get the MRI of the C spine without contrast. Okay. So this is the MRI. Number one, there was a traumatic injury to the anterior longitudinal ligament at C4 and 5, at C4-5, and possibly at C5-6. Plus, there was an injury of the ligamentum flavum at C4-5. There is no evidence of traumatic contusion of the cervical spinal cord. There's a lot of DJD basically that result in moderate encroachment of the s of the central spinal canal at C4-5 with deformity of the cord and mild encroachment at C5-6. So <laughs> I was, I guess, uh, simultaneously surprised and not surprised, right. right? Because this guy's physical exam totally, totally was consistent with a spinal cord injury. Right. And this tells me more, more details of what had what is causing his symptoms so I think so a couple of things come to mind so awesome you ordered you ordered the correct test the MR yeah. um, you know sometimes what what I like to do is I like to get the specialist involved early so at our at our facility we do not have neurosurgery and so we have to transfer those that's right. patients that's right. oftentimes what I might do concurrently with this uh, because I if I truly believe this guy's abnormal order the MR because we know that's going to take a while and get neurosurgery on board and then that way that transfer can be a little bit uh, expedited expedited yeah, yeah. Good word. If, uh, I think that's great um, I, the transfer was was quite simple as it turned out because because you have both the combination of the pretty definitive physical findings and a definitive MR so very simple um, transfer process 
So I was just so excited when I read the op note and the diagnosis by the neurosurgeon because I wasn't sure exactly what my diagnosis was. I thought it was a co cord sy syndrome for sure, some kind of a cord syndrome, but we learn so many things and you kind of forget along the way and, uh, as you've been practicing ER so yeah. long. You know, you don't, if you don't see it often, you'll forget these. But when I looked at the op note, I was very excited about it because doctor, the neurosurgeon, as his preoperative diagnosis, including included in his preoperative diagnosis, he included central cord syndrome as uh, one of the diagnoses. Um, but the the surgery that he performed was C4-5 laminectomies for spinal cord decompression. Um, there is also um, arthrodesis from C3 through C6. And so then when you look at the x-ray, see these screws? Yes, oh yeah, very impressive, very <laughs> yeah. impressive. And it kind of belies how serious this problem is, right? right? I mean, it looks like, okay, this is four screws, eight screws on this guy's neck, and you know, it's no, not a big deal, because you, right. you, you see bigger metallic uh, implements on pe people's bodies, but it really belies how serious this potentially could have been. I mean, oh right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. And a good thing that you didn't stop with the CT and say, oh, this guy's drunk and he's yeah, faking, yeah, yeah. and right. Right, put him in observation overnight, so good job. Good, good. good. Job. All right. All right, so my screencasts all have Two learning focuses. I tried to drill things down so that we're not overloaded with information, but the first learning focus for this screencast obviously is central cord, right? Right. So there are five major cord syndromes that I think we should be aware of. There's anterior cord syndrome, there's the posterior cord syndrome, there's the central cord syndrome, there is the brown saccard, which is extremely rare, and then there's the cotoquina. These are all considered partial or incomplete syndromes. The complete cord syndromes are obviously the quadriplegics or, or uh, paraplegics that have complete uh, transection of their spinal cords and they have no functions below that level. So, well, I thought that to understand uh, central cord syndrome, we need to review our anatomy a little bit, so. Oh, great, that's always good. Yeah, so. Oh my, that's good, that'll be helpful for your <laughs> listeners. <laughs> And viewers. Yeah. No, no, no. Bill, don't worry. I'm not going to do this. I can't possibly do this. So. Oh, okay. I thought well, I was back in medical school all of a sudden. <laughs> it yeah. made me nervous. That's right. We're going to focus, actually, obviously, on the central cord. In my research for this screencast, uh, I came across this uh, wonderful resource. This is a um, emergency physician from um, Ireland who have posted multiple um, videos on Vimeo that are uh, basically anatomy for emergency physicians. And so let's listen to him explain. He probably does a better job than I. Um, we did this last time, so we'll very briefly just summarize. There's three main tracts that we're interested in in the spinal cord. Posterior columns marked in red, carrying mainly touch sensations. Let's think of it as fine touch. Um, we've got the green spinal thalamic tract. Um, it's carrying pain and temperature. And then we've got one descending, one motor tract, um, the, the corticospinal tract. Now, there are multiple more tracts in that. There are multiple more mo modalities being carried, but we're, um, we're keeping this simple just for um, memory's sake. Okay. Now, we've simplified these down to the posterior columns being touch, the um, lateral being motor and the green being pain. What this person has is the area marked in yellow, okay, this is probably what you've already worked out, a central cord syndrome. Now there are different types of cord syndrome, last time we talked about anterior cord syndrome, this time it's central. In a central cord syndrome you can get um, bleeding, usually edema within the central parts um, of the spinal cord and that causes the symptoms that we've described earlier. Okay, you can see there's going to be pressure on the motor tract, so you're going to get weakness and you're going to get pressure on the tracts carrying pain, so you get quite significant pain as well. Now that doesn't explain everything. Why on earth does he have the upper limb distribution? Why does central cord syndrome tend to always affect the upper limbs? Now these tracts are arranged, okay, so that the fibers carrying, um, motor fibers running towards the arms tend to lie more centrally, the fibers running towards the legs will lie more peripherally. Same with the pain and temperature, okay, um, fibers travelling from the arms will lie more central and fibers travelling from the legs will lie more peripheral. So when we get the central cord syndrome, okay, when we get this edema and swelling from s the centre of the cord, it's going to cause pressure on those tracts first and the upper limbs lie more centrally in the tract and they're going to become more affected by it. That's the kind of classic presentation you get with the central cord syndrome. 
Wow, so that really explains this so well, and it makes sense to me now. Uh, it applies totally to my patient. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the guy sounds really smart because he's got a cool accent. That's what I liked. If I had that accent, I'd sound a lot better on this <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> Let's say, who is that, Doctor Fulton? <laughs> that's totally true. All right. So that's a little bit about central cord syndrome. Uh, as he said, it's a hyperextension injury, oftentimes in the seniors because they already have DJD. And like my patient, you can see on the yeah. MRI uh, report that he's got a lot of DJDs already narrowed uh, central canal space already so then uh, it's easier for them to suffer a spinal cord injury when just a simple fall like hyperextension you know when he falls down onto his chin right or his face and he had all he had all the upper extremity findings and you said lower extremities he was fine that's right that's right so yep. now we know why yeah Excellent. that's perfect yep so learning focus number two um we talked a little bit about it, we touched on it, and the fact that the patient had come in without being placed um, on a board or on a, uh, in a column. So I, I definitely was concerned about that. Uh, my reaction, and, and I'm happy to hear your reaction, was to immediately protect his neck. But it's a little bit controversial uh, when I looked into this. Now, we've been long doctors, ER docs for a long time, right? Sure, so we grew time. up with we grew up with the with the the dogma of putting all of the traumas uh, in the collar and in the backboard. But over the past several years, there's been a move away away from that and away from that. And I wonder though if we've gone swung to the other too far in the other way or threw the baby out with the bathwater. So I looked at ASAP, our orga- our own professional organization's policy. Uh, with regard to spinal immobilization. Now, they have a term they call spinal motion restriction. It's a preferred term and preferred okay. method to pr- protect neck, the neck. And essentially, it's to minimize any movement uh, during treatment or transfer uh, and keeping the, the neck in uh, anatomic alignment. They, on, on their website, the ASAP website, EMS Management of Patients with Potential Spinal Injury, <clears throat> there are a couple of, I think, important quotes or lines in here that I, I want to highlight. There are some potential negatives with placing a patient in a collar, including airway compromise, respiratory impairment, aspiration, tissue ischemia, increase in intracranial pressure and pain, and definitely can result in uh, unnecessary or an increased use of diagnostic uh, imaging, as well as an increase in mortality. They they say that spinal motion restriction should be considered for patients with plausible blunt mechanisms of injury in any of the following, altered level of consciousness or clinical intoxication, midline spinal pain and or tenderness, focal neurologic signs and or symptoms such as numbness or motor weakness, anatomic deformity of the spine, or having a distracting injury. They state pretty clearly here, backboards should not be used as therapeutic intervention or as a precautionary measure either inside or outside the hospital or for inter-facility transfers. And then uh, this makes sense and it's just logical, but uh, spinal immobilization should not be used for patients with penetrating trauma without evidence of spinal injury. So your uh, patient uh, met, uh, I think, four out of the five yep. down here. He was altered. He was, uh, had some midline tenderness. Yep. He had neurologic symptoms, and he had that big laceration, which we didn't spend too much time on, but d- could uh, have a distracting injury. So, so again, in this, the, the wording of policies, you know, they have to be very careful. Um, <clears throat> but the the wording here is should be considered, right, as opposed to must, right. Um, so the ASA policy came out in 2015. There's another policy that came out from a different uh, organization. This is the EMS Spinal Precautions and the Use of the Long Backboard Position Statement of the National Association of EMS Physicians and the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. And the two uh, policies are very, very similar. There's slight differences, Um, for instance, Utilization of backboards for spinal immobilization during transport should be judicious so that the potential benefits outweigh risks. So there's still room in this policy for you to put a patient on backboard versus sure. the ASAP policy where there's a pretty 
sort of definitive, uh, don't use it. Right. <laughs> And sometimes it just helps them with transporting the patient, right? Maybe you're somebody who's not uh, strong enough to get up or move, mm-hmm. and it's just mm-hmm. easier to tra- you know transport them That's that right. way. Yeah. And then I think most most ERs I know ours does. We try to get them off that backboard as quickly as That's we can. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, so then here with the uh, e- with this particular uh, policy, they list the appropriate patients that may be immobilized on a backboard um, as blood trauma and altered level of consciousness patients, spinal pain or tenderness neurologic complaint, anatomic deformity of the spine, high energy mechanism of injury, and drug or alcohol intoxication, and inability to communicate, and or distracting injury. So this is similar Very to similar. what yep. uh, ASEP says. Too. Which is nice. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I think this is uh, uh, very good. This part of it, it's not in the ASEP uh, policy, but this is w- what we do kind of, you know, um, day in and day out, because we so see so many sort of uh, minor traumas that that uh, don't really need a, a lot of a spinal cord or spinal protection. So patients for whom immobilization on a backboard is not necessary include those with all of the following. Normal uh, LOC, so the Glasgow 15, there's no spine tenderness or, an, or anatomic abnormality, there's no, no neurologic findings or complaints, there's no distracting injury, and there's no intoxication. And this is this is all just common sense, right, for all, all, all of us. Yeah, makes sense. And I like things in medicine that make sense <laughs> because some things don't. So then, last thing, you know, the spinal precautions can be maintained by application of a rigid cervical collar and securing the patient firmly to the EMS stretcher. And this may be most appropriate for those patients who are found to be ambulatory at the scene, patients who must be transported for a protracted time, uh, particularly prior to interfacility transfer, or those patients for whom a backboard is not otherwise indicated. You know, there are, in our population, a lot of folks that have um, uh, very, very severe neck um, curvature ankylosing spondylitis or just the DJD and forcing those senior citizens down with the collars is just co- torturous, I think. I agree. And the, the other uh, case is when they just don't have a neck. They're a little, <laughs> bit, little bit obese and uh, there's just right. no neck. So you right, right. can't put collars on those That's people right. either. That's right. So is there a bottom line to uh, spinal protection on um, on our, our patients? And I thought about that uh, after looking at all this. I think we have to look at it case by case. The bottom line is to be um, always be a mindful of the potential for a spinal cord injury on anybody who is has fallen, um, and make sure you have a you do a very good physical exam, get a good history from a patient, and also it's important, like you mentioned earlier, not to discard a patient's complaints just because they're intoxicated. We really have to give them the benefit of the benefit of the doubt. And, um, you know, one day you'll say, save somebody's neck like this guy. Exactly right. Exa- <laughs> exactly. And, it, and even those patients that are always falling and stumbling that come into our ERs all right. the time, and right. we, we kind of get cavalier and just think That's it's right. uh, Mr. Smith again. Right, right. You have to be careful and That's make right. sure that you're ruling out the bad stuff. That's what we do in ER. That's, right? Right. That's why we went to ER, That's because right. we, we love finding and taking care of people who have bad stuff. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Fulton, for joining me again. Well, thank you, Alice. I, I enjoyed this. You. I love having you. So thanks, everyone, for watching this month. I hope that you've enjoyed these episodes. I hope that you learned something from our discussion this month of uh, central cord syndrome and that perhaps this will help you uh, avert a disaster in the future. So we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>